Today we've got a great revenge story against an HOA that tried to sneak a foreclosure. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, shake my seat, have some beer. I was on a train, two guys sat behind me and were being loud and obnoxious. The dude directly behind me bumped, kicked, punched my seat about once a minute. After like 10 times, I turned around and asked him to leave my seat alone. They looked at me, he said, oh, sorry. I turned back around and after a minute or two, he started the bumping back up again. I was silently fuming and started packing my stuff to change seats. This was when I heard them open some beers, which by the way is forbidden here on local trains. Dude behind me lowered the tray on the back of my seat. At this point I stood up and packed my stuff into my backpack and saw that he had put the beer onto the tray. I packed up everything, all that was left was zipping up my backpack. I put my backpack into the seat I'd just been sitting in and acted as if I wasn't done yet, waiting for the right moment. The moment came. The guy turned to his buddy, loudly talking and gesturing. His beer was standing freely on the tray. I lifted my backpack, gripped the zipper and zipped it up in a swift motion. Sadly, my finger slipped from the zipper and the back of my fist at the top of my seat, really forcefully. Oh no! The beer can toppled over, all over the tray and the lower part of his stomach and his crotch. He did catch it surprisingly quickly, but at least half the can was emptied all over the tray and him. He looked up at me with an expression of horror in his face. I said, oh sorry, and left. I'm just left wondering if this guy didn't get in any further trouble with this because like you can smell it, right? If he's truly drinking a beer here, they have to be able to smell that, right? Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy awesome stories of revenge, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is, City wants to remove our residential only parking and ticket us. As the title states, my childhood home's on-street private residential parking was taken away one day without notice, due to what should have been an obvious error. My parents had purchased a home in a growing downtown 20 plus years earlier, and the property was taxed on and included three on-street parking spaces. These were spaces the city had agreed to when they permitted three churches and a ton of small businesses around our home, making parking near our residence extremely limited. Our parking was on the side of our home on a cut-through street. The sidewalk had a double yellow curb, painted by the city to denote those spots were private, shouldn't be used, and also had private residence parking signs. Well, the city one day takes out the 20 plus year old private residence parking signs and says no parking at all due to the yellow line. The local sheriffs start ticketing my parents. So my dad goes down to the courthouse and explains the situation and asks them to rectify the issue. The courthouse lady refused to acknowledge any of the facts and said he can wait for his day in court if he wants to argue. My dad then thought up a great idea. The city had never properly lined the main street for no street parking, which made parking on it entirely legal. So the next day, my dad went out and bought the cheapest driving beater he could and parked it directly on the two-way main street, directly in front of our home, and left it there. Cue the cops showing up quickly and calling a tow company that looked at it and said they wouldn't touch it because it's technically legal. We got a knock on the door and it's the sheriff. He starts begging my dad to move it. My dad says it's legal. He's not moving it as the current situation has left him with no other parking choices. He explains the entire situation to him and tells the sheriff he can talk to the lady down at the courthouse as she will not listen to him or common sense. The sheriff calls the lady and lets her know what a stupid freaking situation she's created and tells her to fix it now. Cue him putting her on and the courthouse lady says, you have your spots and signs back and the sheriff took care of the tickets. I'm glad for OP's sake that they were able to get this solved, done and dusted before having to go to court and deal with that. Because when it's so cut and dry like that, it's frustrating that you have to sacrifice all those man hours trying to point out the obvious. Our next story is, mechanic sold me a car that needed $2,000 plus dollars in repairs. I recently bought a car from a mechanic who lied to me about the condition of the car. He had said it was basically in perfect condition and only needed brakes to pass the safety inspection in my country. I ended up needing to spend over $2,000 post-purchase to make it roadworthy. As a student, I can't really afford setbacks like that, and it's caused me a lot of problems lately. The guy I brought it from had cleared an engine light without fixing the problem and just covered up things right before I came to look at the car, like moving it so I couldn't see leaks on the pavement, etc. With no other way to get back at him, 
I was able to find his mother's Facebook account and send a lengthy message about how it's affected me and my future. Probably as petty as it gets, but I'm honestly really ticked because he's put a lot of effort into selling me a real piece of garbage and I have literally no other way of getting back the money that I lost. I hope you have a really awkward Christmas dinner, Derek. Honestly, if I were an OP situation, I would be going around trying to find any way to tarnish this guy's reputation. I would check if he's affiliated with any notable companies as a mechanic. I would be leaving reviews all over any website that has their name on it. I'd probably actually engage in all of those neighborhood community websites just to call out this dude. And knowing me, that's a big thing because I despise the idea of interacting on those things. Our next story is Christmas parking at the mall. This happened back in the late 80s, but it fits really well here. At the time this happened, I was an auto mechanic and drove an old beater 77 Dodge Aspen to work every day. It was a tank. Looked like heck, but I kept it mechanically sound. After work one day during the Christmas holidays, I went straight to the mall to get some shopping done. There were lots of cars there, and I was cruising up and down the aisles looking for a parking space. A car started up in a space right next to the handicapped spaces up front. So I turned on my signal and waited for them to back out. He backed out with his rear in my direction, and this old lady in a Lincoln Town car dashed in front of them and into the space. She jumped out of the car and hightailed it into the mall. In the 80s Fords, Lincolns, and Mercuries, there's an inertial cutoff switch for the electric fuel pump. It's just a simple steel ball that completes the circuit to the pump, and any sudden jolt will cause the ball to stick to the magnet in the top of the switch, breaking the circuit. Remembering this, I took that old Dodge and just tapped the bumper on the town car. Not enough to damage the bumper, but enough to trip the fuel pump cutoff switch. I parked at the back and went inside to shop. When I came out, the woman was sitting in the car just grinding on the starter. I walked right past her and put my packages into the Dodge. I went back in and could hear the starter getting slower and slower as I walked by. Remember, this was before cell phones, so I kinda hung around the entrance nearest her. She comes in and I see her go to the payphone and I hear her call a wrecker to get her car. I leave about 20 minutes later and the wrecker is hooking up to her car. I know the driver, he tows for our shop, so I stop and wish him a Merry Christmas. Turns out he gave me a big Christmas present. That town car was dropped at our shop for repairs. I don't normally work on Fords, but I asked the owner if I could please have that one. He gave me the ticket. I opened the trunk, reset the cutoff switch, boosted it off, and drove it into the shop. She ruined the battery with the excessive cranking, so he sold her a battery in two hours of diagnostic time. That paid for my wife's Christmas gift that year. It's like the gift that keeps on giving. You thought you had your own little revenge, and Granny comes in staying over for Christmas giving you an extra serving of her special baked cookies. This next story is, I came out of the grocery store and found a truck parked one inch from my driver's side door. So I park and walk into the grocery store for some essentials. When I parked, there were no cars around me. I come back out to find a very large lifted Dodge parked next to me on my driver's side. As I approach the car, I see it. There is maybe an inch of clearance between this truck and my car as it's parked over the line in my spot. Rage is putting it lightly when I say I was upset. At this point, I climb in my passenger side and get into my seat. Backing out with a truck this close was even a pain. I had to fold in my mirror not to hit it. As I'm backing out, my petty brain took over. I readjusted my car and parked so I could get out of my driver's side door. I grabbed a pen I had in the car and proceeded to let the air out of the truck's passenger side tires. I can't tell you how satisfying it was to watch that overgrown hot dog mobile shrink to the ground one tire at a time. I did too because no one carries two spares and I figured they deserve the inconvenience. I then got back in my car and left. Didn't get to see the aftermath but I enjoyed picturing it in my mind many times. I guess for OP's sake, I'm glad it didn't go any further. You know, somebody trying to get the CCTV footage and try to figure out who exactly it was. I don't know, is that a bit of a leap for a couple of deflated tires? Our next story is, cheat on me, I'll steal back from you. This happened to me many years ago. I had a live-in girlfriend and partner before my marriage and divorce. We were in our early to mid-twenties. We had our own accounts individually and we had one joint bank account. That ex of mine had started taking several girls trips after a couple of years of our live-in relationship, even though our sex life was quite healthy. 
I started having my suspicions when she asked me not to drop her to the airport anymore as she was going in with her friends. The biggest suspicion came when she requested I not drop her off even to the friend's place that she was going to catch the taxi to the airport from. What was worse was she always withdrew a fixed and a decently large sum of money from the joint account each time before the girl's trip. Now, one day I happened to catch her on the phone talking to what I can only imagine was a guy, completely unaware that her voice was carrying. I go into her email. Yes, she had a poorly chosen password. I find some explicit pics of her sent to a guy. Fast forward to the day of her trip. She goes in for a shower. I take her wallet out, take out all of the credit cards we jointly owned, empty the envelope of cash, replace it with a printout of the email with the photo and write goodbye and good riddance on the back and put the envelope back in. Don't say a word to her and put the envelope of cash and wallet back in. After she leaves, I withdraw money she'd taken for her girl's trips from the various credit cards. Suffice it to say I got some angry phone calls from her trip, which I promptly sent to voicemail. Used the weekend to move out of the apartment we lived in, thankfully it was in her name, left her some cash for the remainder of the month as rent, and a goodbye note. You cheat on me, I'll get at least my money back. I think it's pretty fair what OP did here. Honestly, I think OP was more than fair. They actually left money for the rent for the rest of the month. Better people would take everything they could and some and just try to run off into the sunset. This next story is enjoy the sandwich. There's a white BMW X7 that I see nearly every day speeding in a school zone. It's a 15 mile per hour zone when these lights are flashing before and after school starts. I have to cross two crosswalks to get to my son's school. Sure enough, as I was walking across the crosswalk, Here comes the middle-aged woman in the BMW hauling butt. I was holding a half-eaten PB&J. She wasn't going to stop, so I stepped back and I threw my sandwich at the side of her car. Peanut butter smeared across the gleaming white paint. She didn't stop and kept speeding. I wish I could have seen her face when she noticed the PB streak. How much do you guys want to bet that she's going to run off, go to a car wash, and just get that PB&J smeared all over those flaps that roll over the car? probably left some nice residue for the next couple people behind her. Or if we're really lucky, she ended up not noticing and let it bake on the side of her car. Our next story is, neighbor cut my sunshade straps. Few weeks ago, I pulled into a campground. Next door neighbor had used up his entire spot and had a shed on my lot by a few inches. Behind the shed on the other side, he kept his trash cans. I set up my camper, put out my awning, and dropped my screened in porch. This meant he could no longer walk through my campsite to throw out his garbage. He now had to go the other way around his camper. It also meant his dogs couldn't come over and crap outside my front steps. I'm guessing he got mad about all of this and the fact that I called the camp host to make him clean up all the dog crap. He has two Irish setters. Anyways, I come home from work on Sunday to find my bungee cords cut. It must have took whoever about six tries to cut through it judging by the looks of it. I'm thinking it's their kid. I was a little ticked, but freak it. The cords were old and stretched out, so I bought some new ones. On Wednesday, I come home from work and all of my straps are undone, stakes pulled out of the ground. At this point, I know it's not their little kid. I put my new locking straps on, set up my new camera to look out the window, and went on my way. Next Sunday, I come home from work, my straps are cut and part of one is tossed on the roof. Check the camera, and I'll be danged if this jerk cuts my straps with a set of shears from his shed. Alright freak face, game on. I stew for a few days thinking about how I'm going to freak this jerk over. Light bulb goes off, and I shoot up to Lowe's and purchase two fly traps. You fill these bags with water and they trap flies, hundreds of them and they smell like a steaming dead body smothered with fresh diarrhea. I waited almost a week until they were full. Next Sunday morning at 5.30 as I'm about to leave for work, I have my camper hooked up and ready to leave. I dumped the first one down his fresh air intake on his brand new Ram 3500 dually. By chance, I checked his door, and it was open. So the second bag I slapped in the driver's seat, and then I tossed my cut up cords in the bed of his truck. It smelled so bad I almost puked myself. Cut my straps, get the fly traps, bench. So my question is, if this guy was actually able to like pursue some kind of litigation, you know, for the vandalism of his truck, would this just become an ultimate nasty battle where OP presents their case and they kind of go back and forth with the evidence of both of them having done this? 
I mean, I guess unless OP left fingerprints, there isn't, like, concise evidence that it was OP. This next story is, screw you and your cake. The company started out being family owned and treated the employees great. Casual dress code, easy going. I was young and it felt more like going to hang out with friends versus going to work. I was a shift supervisor at the start and as I said, all the calls got answered, work was completed on time and everything was very laid back. The last family member died during my sixth year and a new board of directors slash CEO took over and everything went corporate overnight. Button down shirt, dress pants, no sneakers other than Fridays. I guess jeans and sneakers on a Friday doesn't lower the stock price. The team I managed was all tech support, non-customer facing, so forcing them into dress shoes and dress pants seemed dumb. That was the start of my disgruntled nature. One of our CEOs who had an office on our building was so petty he would sneak into the call center on the weekends, when the rest of the office was closed, take off his shoes so as to make no noise, and in his stocking feet, sneak in the back door of the call center to look under desks to make sure nobody was wearing sneakers. Then complained to me and my manager when he found somebody. Another fun petty fact, I started pouring water on the kitchen floor by the call center back door so he could step in it with his stocking feet and just shrugged it off as somebody must have spilled something when he benched. I got a new manager. He was vastly untechnical and micromanaging. A very, very annoying man. He was also very, very passive. He would do something stupid. I'd yell at him face to face in his office and he would say nothing after sitting down at my desk, 10 feet away from his office. I would get a strongly worded email about our interaction, along with the new corporate overlord, chances the company got super cheap unless it was managers meetings or special occasions where they could put on the public appearance of being a family friendly place to work. Cue the company's 10 year anniversary. All the bigwigs come down to our office, a few fly in from other states, they have a huge sheet cake that has the name of the company and 10 years written on it. It was sitting unguarded in the cafe. As I was walking through, I noticed nobody was around, grabbed a knife from the table, and cut out a perfect square out of the middle of the cake. And like a fat kid, I ate it with my bare hands. I nearly choked trying to eat it so quickly, worried somebody would come into the cafe. Imagine that Heimlich maneuver. Hey, what's he choking on? Stolen cake! I washed my hands quickly of frosting and flee. A few minutes later, our CEO flanked by his cronies came storming through the call center, yelling that he wanted to know who ate the cake. They had a professional photographer who was going to take a photo of all of them behind the cake for the local newspaper. And now the 10 years and a huge chunk of the company name is missing. I sat quietly and said nothing. In fact, this is the first time I've spoken about this in 15 years. Freak you and your cake. You know, even 15 years ago, I'm surprised they didn't have some kind of CCTV that would indicate who it was. Lord knows though, if I were the one willing to try to do this revenge, I would have managed to get frosting on my shirt regardless of how careful I was trying to be. No matter what, it's just going to happen. Our next story is, I can't eat that? Earlier this year, I was diagnosed as type 2 diabetic. It meant that I had to change my diet. Out went crisps, chips in the US chips, fries in the US, roast potatoes, pizza, donuts, and worst of all, sweets and chocolate. I'm not saying I ate these in excess, just occasionally they were a treat or reward for me having completed a task I didn't want to do. My partner was very supportive for about a week. After that, he was buying more sweets than normal, and when we went out, he would often say, do you want chips with that? Or shall we get these sweets or these ones? followed with, oh yeah, you can't have that, can you? Last week, he was diagnosed with gallstones. His diet has to be very low fat, no milk, cream, fatty meats, bacon, or cheese. We went shopping today and I was picking up his favorite cheeses, cream cakes, and asking, do you want these? Oh, you can't have them, can you? Then putting them in the trolley. Now excuse me while I go and eat all the cheese I bought. I mean, it might be funny enough if they were doing this once or twice, but yeah, when it's literally against what you can actually eat unless you want to have real complications with your health, it gets pretty old pretty quickly. Guess they had to learn that lesson though. This next story is, try to sneak a foreclosure, lose my business and everyone else's. For anyone who has ever served on an HOA board, 
You know that most of the violations, accounting, and general management of an HOA, especially with a neighborhood the size I run, is handled by a property management company. This is mainly because it would be too expensive and biased to have someone who lives in the community handle all of these duties alone. A dirty little secret of these companies, however, that many of these companies will make their prices cheaper by secretly passing fining policies onto homeowners that the board has no control over. Hence today's story. Main story, about a month ago, we were conducting a regular HOA meeting. We've been having them fairly often to keep our board, management company rep, and homeowners in a sink since I've been hearing complaints of bad behavior from the management company. This particular meeting, however, things almost got out of control. As soon as we finished all of our checklist items, we asked homeowners about any questions. A couple stood up and I saw the man holding a paper with a shaking hand, which I quickly learned was due to his anger. Over the next 10 minutes, he explained how he was here to plead his case for the board not to foreclose on his house, especially since he had been making payments on a large debt for a very long time. Without going into too many details, the discussion got extremely heated because our management company had told us not to get involved since this homeowner had already been involved with our lawyers. After lots of arguing, the meeting was finally over. I left totally confused because I knew that the homeowner was in good standing and if he was willing to pay, which the records showed he had called to do so, why couldn't he? I had been told by my property manager to not take any action and I decided to call BS. I called the legal firm representing the board, which I was told to not do, even though they represent us? After talking with the firm for an hour, I found out that the management company had not allowed this homeowner to pay his fines and dues because of a petty procedural technicality, and that instead, they were slapping fines on him like there was no tomorrow. I quickly told the lawyer to offer to settle this balance with no fines, and the issue was resolved the next day. Revenge? I spent more time looking into our management company and found out they would underbid management contract costs and supplement them by adding in their own fines onto the homeowner collections without the board's approval. This is a technicality in the fining process and while it's not illegal, it's highly unethical and disputable because it encourages the management company to fine and escalate non-issues since to make more money. I honestly felt horrendous because I had no idea, because it's a one-line clause in the contract. I also received a call from our community manager urging us to stop waiving fines since it sets a bad example. That really sent me over the edge. Livid with this phone call and new knowledge about fines, I found a new management company and terminated our contract immediately. In addition, I believe I found a loophole where all of the charges unfairly pressed against homeowners will not be recouped by the company and the HOA cannot be liable for them since they are passed through. During the issue with the property investment company, see other post, I met about a dozen other HOA board members in my area and discovered about six of them are using the same company and even community manager. I urged them to look into the same issues and they soon discovered the horrors for themselves. It sounds like all of them will be terminating their contracts too. One of the other association presidents actually knows state council for HOA rules, and they're now working with them to make this practice illegal. If it passes, this entire company would go under. While I'm not holding my breath, I am certainly following the legal proceedings closely, and have even offered to testify before a committee why this rule is needed. It sounds like deliberations begin in January. As for the community manager, the person helping our community, they've lost over half of their contracts and their manager came begging for me to stay. They even offered to stop the fining policy in the most corporate talk way possible, where they basically gave themselves plausible deniability if they do it again. I told them that his property manager deserved what she had coming to her, and that their policies were stone cold terrible. He tried to reply, but I just hung up. I was too angry. Watch these management companies closely. They are almost all seriously snakes in the grass waiting to screw over board members and community members. I mean, if I didn't hear enough horror stories about HOAs in general, now there's an extra company above that or associated to the side of that that might also be causing most of these headaches? What a nightmare all around. Our next story is, you expect me to back up and let you through when you're in my lane? 16-ish years ago, when I lived in California in the greater Los Angeles area, 
parking was at a premium. I don't imagine it's changed much since I left, if anything it's probably worse. So when people would move in or out, the moving trucks would often be double parked. The law said that if the truck was in your lane, you could proceed around the truck in the wrong lane provided the traffic was clear in that lane. I don't remember where I was headed this particular night, but as I'm heading down the street, I notice a moving truck parked in the oncoming lane. No big deal, it isn't going to affect my travel in the least. That is, until a compact car goes to pass the moving truck. This car is now in my lane, coming at me head on. Now, I could have stopped short and given this car room to go around, but I'm petty, particularly when the law is on my side. So I wait to stop my truck until my nose is nearly even with the front of the moving truck, residential street so speed limit is 25 and not sure either of us were even going that fast. The man in the car proceeds to start honking obnoxiously and my headlights are aimed directly into his cab so I can see him pitching a fit, yelling, shaking his fists, thrashing around and turning rather red in the face in the seat. I didn't move or react in any way other than to reach up and put my truck in park. And his car isn't tall enough to light up my cab to see what I'm doing anyway. I watch him pitching his fit and listen to his horn for a few minutes before calmly lighting a cigarette while staring at him. The flame from my lighter is, I believe, enough to see that I'm calmly watching his tantrum. Plus, the glow of the cigarette afterwards shows the slow, unhurried movements of me calmly watching him. The man-child on the compact finally figures out that I'm not going to move and let him by, so he finally puts the car in reverse and backs in behind the truck, where he should have remained until I was past it in the first place. I then put my truck back in drive and proceed on my way. My side windows were darkly tinted, yes, illegal in California, but not so in Wyoming where I'd just gotten the truck from, so I doubt he saw the grin I was sporting after this lesson in passing laws or my little toodaloo wave. Edit to clear a few things up, additions are below. I am a woman, I've never had a hot dog and I have no desire to add one to my person at any point in the future. The compact and I were equal distances from the front and back of the moving truck when this took place. I only had time to stop where I did because I slammed on my brakes when the car pulled into my lane. I was startled into the rapid brake application as he hadn't done the normal move slightly left to check the oncoming lane for traffic that everyone else did, just full on pulled into my lane without even looking. Had I continued the stomp of the brakes and squealing of my tires, yes, I could have stopped in time to let the compact squeeze between me and the front of the truck. I should not have had to continue the abuse to my tires, brakes, and shocks to accommodate his illegal maneuver, nor was I going to abuse the new-to-me truck in such a way. I could have kept going until we met mid-truck, but I was kind of fascinated that he was really still coming at me, and I'm petty enough to see how far he was going to decide he wanted to back up. The headlights were standard lights for a 97 Dodge Ram. Those aren't very bright lights at all, nor did I turn on my high beams. They were slightly oxidized at the time, further dimming them. If the compact hadn't pulled up so tight to the front of my truck, the lights would not have shined into his cab in such a manner. The truck came with a factory installed 6 inch lift, and the previous owner was running 33 inch tires and darkly tinted windows, which were still on it at the time of this incident, as I hadn't had it long enough to change much, if anything. I could have peeled the tint off, but I knew I would be moving to a state where it was legal shortly after this, so I left it alone. I did look into getting the ultra bright headlights for it last year, but as they would remove my high beams, I opted to put the standard headlight bulbs back in it and remove the oxidization on the lenses instead. I also dropped the 33 inch tires and went with some 29 inch that are the recommended size for the truck. They look a little too small, but my gas mileage is a little better. I still have the same tint. It is bubbling because it's so old, so when I do replace it, it'll be a lighter tint than it currently possesses, as the reflections off it at night are terrible. To be honest, it's definitely not something that I would have done, mostly because, in my heart, while I feel like I would be petty enough, in reality I don't think I would care enough to sit there and waste my time, but I definitely would be frustrated by this jerk trying to do what he did. I'd probably just keep on going while silently steaming to myself about it though. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another awesome revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.